Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And what we're going to do today is ask a question. Can a cowboy save America? And along the way, we're going to meet the muckrakers. We're going to kill a giant octopus. We're going to save a little baby bear. We're going to dig a huge ditch. We're going to sail around the world. And we're going to pick out your favorite art. Because today we are going to discuss Theodore Roosevelt and Roosevelt's square deal. And we're going to follow that outline right up above my little yellow box. So put it in your notes to serve as a framework for the information that's about to follow. Because you should have almost finished an answer to that question. America's industrial age. Golden, gilded, or dark. Evaluate the historical events between 1860 and 1920 in terms of society, politics, and the economy and develop an argument that supports one of these three interpretations on this critical period in American history. The story so far, the anarchists are out there. They have attempted to kill the robber baron, Henry Frick. They have murdered the American president, William McKinley. The entire nation is on the edge of major upheaval. Labor is battling with capital. They are burning down steel mills. They are setting Pullman train cars on fire. No one is backing down. And every time labor and capital clash, it becomes larger and more violent and nobody is backing down. And people are sick of the clash. They do not trust the robber barons and the anarchists and the socialists grow more and more powerful every year. Because even before McKinley's assassination, the country is turning against the trusts and a new political force begins to emerge in the 1880s and 1890s. These agrarian socialists known as the populist party, they are determined to break the power of the trusts and these crazy agrarian socialists get started in that most socialist of states, Texas. Because the Texas farmers were really getting oppressed by the railroads. They would bring their crops to the railheads, to the rail stations, only to find outrageous fares being charged to move the corn, outrageous fares being charged to move the wheat, and they would have to store all of their grain in the railroads, warehouses where they were being charged outrageous rates. They were sick of it. So these agrarian socialists wanted to break the power of the railroads. They wanted to break the power of the trusts. They wanted nationalized railroads. They wanted a mandated eight hour workday. They wanted collective bargaining. They wanted government warehouses. And they emerge as a strong third party in the 1880s before eventually merging and then completely reshaping the Democratic Party in the 1890s. And by the election of 1896, the Populist Party has swallowed the old Democratic Party. The old Democratic Party, the Bourbon Democrats, was run by a bunch of ex-Confederates who built the Jim Crow South, but those guys are history by the time we get to the 1890s. The populists, the agrarian socialists, have taken over the Democratic Party, and they are now the populist Democrats. So much so that they are able to determine and put their man in place to run for the presidency of the United States, and that man is William Jennings Bryan, a populist socialist. Now, William Jennings Bryan makes a serious run for the White House in 1896, and he terrifies the robber barons. He terrifies the big monopolistic trusts. After all, here is a man who is basically campaigning on a platform of nationalizing railroads, nationalizing warehouses, breaking up and having the government seize most of the assets of these big monopolistic trusts. He has them terrified. So the big trusts get their candidate. They line up their man. And that man is William McKinley. And now William Jennings Bryan loses the 1896 election. And while Bryan lost the 1896 election, it was a lot closer than expected. He came very close to winning the whole enchilada. And, you know, kind of think about this for a moment. 47% of the country voted for a man who was basically an agrarian socialist, voting for a candidate, William Jennings Bryan, who was dedicated to smashing the trusts. And indeed, uh, he scares the big trusts and the robber barons so much that when they back William McKinley, they basically loan his campaign somewhere between three and four million dollars. 
And that's in 1896 money. That's, that's a lot of money today. And basically, while William, William Jennings Bryan lost the election, a lot of people say McKinley basically just bought the White House. Accusations of bribery and corruption follow William McKinley into the White House, which is why when it comes time for him to be reelected in 1900, he wants to pick a vice presidential candidate who is squeaky clean. He wants to pick a vice presidential running mate who can kind of clean up kind of the smear that McKinley has acquired after the 1896 election. And he picks this rapid up and comer within the Republican party, Theodore Roosevelt. And this is Theodore Roosevelt, cowboy, historian, war hero from the Spanish-American War, police commissioner of New York City. And then he comes back from the Spanish-American War and gets elected as the governor of New York State. And as uh, when he was the New York City police commissioner, he cleaned up a notoriously corrupt force. And one of the things he did was outrageous. He would actually walk the beat with individual cops. In fact, as police commissioner, he would show up at these neglected precincts, kind of ask the police captain who he thought was the most corrupt cop there, and basically stick himself next to that corrupt cop and follow him around for a week. All right. In fact, uh, Commissioner Gordon from the Batman franchise is based on Theodore Roosevelt's days as, you know, police commissioner of New York. And as police commissioner, Roosevelt directly challenged Tammany Hall and indeed largely purged the city police of the corrupt influence that Tammany Hall had on the police force. He acquires an incredible reputation. Then he becomes the governor of New York State, where Teddy Roosevelt builds this really impressive, li impressive list of tackling the trusts and dealing directly with the robber barons. And his approach is completely novel. His approach is to say, we're going to reform the system. We're not going to go for a direct revolution. TR's approach to fixing the economic and social situation is patriotic reform. And he says, patriotic reform is what we're going to do to avoid populist revolution. So he brings in these robber barons and he says, you guys have a public responsibility to your fellow Americans. He brings in these factory owners and says, you are going to pay your men a living wage. And the factory owner is like, why? And the governor of New York, Teddy Roosevelt, would say, because that's what Americans do. We look after our own. Do you love America? Are you a good American? And the factory owner's like, yeah, I am a good American. Then pay your workers fairly. And they would agree, all right? And furthermore, Theodore Roosevelt points out, if you don't embrace patriotic reform now, you are eventually going to have to deal with violent, violent revolution tomorrow. And he develops this really popular following. People are like, Theodore Roosevelt is cleaning up. He cleaned up New York City. He's about to clean up New York State. He's a Republican, but he is dedicated to fighting the trusts and bringing in the robber barons to heal. He has a reputation as a dedicated antitrust reformer. And the trusts are like, the robber barons are like, look, we can take this squeaky clean Theodore Roosevelt and attach him to our guy, William McKinley, who we already bought, and we can use Teddy Roosevelt's reputation to clean up the oily reputation of William McKinley. We'll make him vice president because, you know, it's not like vice presidents ever really amount to anything, right? On September 14th, 1901, Theodore Roosevelt becomes president of the United States. He is 42 years old and becomes the youngest president in American history. Roosevelt explodes into an avalanche of reform that he calls the Square Deal. And the Square Deal consists of the following. Widespread federal regulation, regulation of food and drugs, regulation of the railroads, regulation of labor laws, government arbitration of labor disputes, and laws forbidding child labor. Roosevelt says, look, we're not going to break up the trusts but the trusts must follow the law. 
the trusts must deal fairly and squarely with their fellow Americans. And as Americans, we can make this country work in a way that it's never worked before. He appeals to their patriotism. He says, look, you robber barons, as Americans, you owe it to your fellow citizens to treat them fairly. And it's this huge extension of the same policy he did back when he was governor of New York. And he takes his appeals directly to the people. He gives these speeches to these massive cheering crowds. And the insane thing is that it works. He appeals to the patriotism and it works. And for the people it doesn't work with, well, he's got a plan for those guys. But in carrying out the square deal, he finds three very unlikely allies. And his first group of allies are the muckrakers. And the muckrakers are this crusading group of journalists journalists dedicated to uncovering the corruption of the trusts, the corruption of, of bribed politicians, and, you know, muckrakers like Ida Tarbell, who uncovered the secret history of Standard Oil, muckrakers like Upton Sinclair, who investigated the filth and disease of the meatpacking industry, crusaders like Samuel Adams, who revealed that all of these medicines that were being sold across the country were you know, basically just made up snake oil that couldn't fix anything and often did more harm than good. These muckrakers wrote sensational exposés in the journals of the day, and these, these are, stories were turned into bound books that anyone could read and told people exactly what was going on in all of these various industries. You know, and you can see from the cartoon right up above me, Theodore Roosevelt would open these books and these books would tell him exactly how to go after certain robber barons exactly how to uncover the corruption of each industry. And then he goes to the robber barons themselves. And he's like, look, you guys, we've got to work together to enact patriotic reform. We either do patriotic reform now, or we're going to have to address populist revolt tomorrow. And he goes and he speaks with Andrew Carnegie. And he expects a lot of opposition. But then Andrew Carnegie looks at him and goes... I completely agree with you, Mr. President. We must embrace patriotic reform now. We must give back to this country that has given so much to us. And everyone is surprised by this because Andrew Carnegie becomes the robber baron who turns on his fellow robber barons. Remember, Andrew Carnegie didn't grow up with money. Andrew Carnegie was a penniless Scottish immigrant who became one of the richest men in the United States. Andrew Carnegie sells Carnegie Steel. He breaks it up and he sells it for you know hundreds of millions of dollars. And then what Andrew Carnegie does, he proceeds to take that fortune and give most of it away. He crisscrosses the country. He becomes one of the greatest philanthropists the country has ever seen. In fact, in East Texas, you can go to the city of Tyler and you walk around downtown Tyler if you turn the right corner, you find this huge plaque that says, on this site was one of the first public libraries in East Texas, funded by a generous donation from Andrew Carnegie. He goes around the country building libraries, funding schools, sending people to college, building art museums, building Carnegie Hall. And he gets on the side of Theodore Roosevelt. And he says, this is how you steal with robber barons. This is how you deal with these people who think laws don't apply to them because they're so wealthy and so powerful. And Andrew Carnegie becomes Theodore Roosevelt's second great ally in the square deal. But there's his third great ally, Samuel Gompers. And our final man, our final ally is Samuel Gompers. Now, Samuel Gompers, uh, Roosevelt knew Samuel Gompers back from his days as the governor of New York. And Samuel Gompers is the leader of the largest labor union in the United States, the American Federation of Labor. And the American Federation is the successor to the old defunct Knights of Labor that like broke apart in the 1880s. And Samuel Gompers heeded Roosevelt's call for moderate reform. And Gompers is a really interesting individual. 
Gompers proceeds to cleanse the American Federation of Labor. He forces out all of the radical elements. He says, we're not having any socialists. We're not having any communists. We're not having any anarchists. He actually forces Eugene Debs out of the labor movement. And he says, look, we have to work smartly with these trusts. We have to work with the federal government to get what we want. We're going to settle on a series of negotiations with these big corporations. Instead of these big violent strikes, what we're going to do is we're going to go for collective bargaining and arbitration when we can. And through that, we can achieve all of the goals we want. Because Gompers has his friend in the president, and they're going to go into arbitration and avoid these big destructive strikes like, you know, Homestead or these big riots like Haymarket. What Gompers did is he wanted to democratize the labor movement. He specifically wanted the members of his union to vote. And he says, look, if we've got 50,000 members of the American Federation of the Labor, and we say you are going to vote for candidate X, and all of you guys go and vote for candidate X, then we can, we can determine who the mayor is. We can pick out who we want to be governor. We can pick out who's going to be police commissioner and who's going to be senator and who's going to be our congressman. And those guys are going to owe us. So when we want things to be done and when we have to enter arbitration with a big trust, the government will be on our side because we bloody elected the government. And it works. It starts to work. But Roosevelt runs into enemies of the square deal. Not everybody is on board with this. And the main person who fights it is John D. Rockefeller, the owner of Standard Oil, the richest man in America, and the first American billionaire. John D. Rockefeller says, I have nothing to fix. There's nothing wrong with America that needs to be fixed. I built this great company. I control the petroleum industry in America. I've made America stronger. I can deliver oil better and cheaper and more efficiently. I, have, I didn't monopolize the oil industry. I cleaned it up, all right? So John D. Rockefeller absolutely refuses to have anything to do with this and becomes a, 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 an opponent of the square deal, and he will bedevil the Roosevelt administration for its, its entire existence. And the first real challenge for uh, Theodore Roosevelt comes when he, he's only been in office for about a year, and that is the great coal strike of 1902. In 1902, the Pennsylvania coal miners go on strike. And remember, this is the old territory of the Molly Maguires, so you have to walk carefully. The miners wanted the following. Collective bargaining, safety improvements, a 10% wage increase, and a nine-hour work day. They, just, they choose to go on strike just before winter, so like the households will not receive their winter shipments of coal to keep warm. This makes it a major American problem. And again, it started like every other strike. The workers have completely reasonable demands. The demands are refused. The picket lines are formed. The workers are met with force. The mine owners then call on the army. You can see in the photograph right up above me, the miners have actually erected a barricade in front of the mines because they're expecting to be attacked by the U.S. Army. And then the U.S. Army doesn't show up. The President of the United States appears in front of their picket line. Teddy Roosevelt refused to allow American soldiers to crush the strike. He says, we are all going to meet. We are going to enter a binding arbitration. I will be one of the arbiters and we will come to an agreement. We are going to sit around a table and work these things out. Until the miners are happy the mine owners are happy, and the railroads are happy. And the miners are like, that's impossible. All of these people are not going to agree. You're trying to accomplish the impossible. And Theodore Roosevelt says, Americans can always accomplish the impossible. Patriotic reform. So the miners and the owners agree to negotiate. Every side's got to give a little. And Roosevelt, even you know, through Andrew Carnegie, got J.P. Morgan involved. You know, the other, the great money trust of uh, money trust, Robert Barron of Wall Street. He gets J.P. Morgan involved and to apply pressure to the miners because they all owe him a ton of money. And in the end, because the miners had completely reasonable demands and the arbitration was binding, 
the miners got everything they wanted. They shook hands. They shook hands with the president. They shook hands with the representative of J.P. Morgan. Everybody stood up, you know, and slowly filed out of the room. And the miners are standing around going, did we just win? And the answer is yes. They won the coal strike. Everyone got what they wanted. The mine reopened. People got their winter coal. And everyone was like, Theodore Roosevelt accomplished the impossible. But it didn't always work like that. Not all of the trusts were willing to work with Theodore Roosevelt. But together with Carnegie, together with J.P. Morgan, as well as a radical new legislation, Theodore Roosevelt goes hunting for trusts. And he starts making use of a law that most people consider to be completely worthless. But it ends up being one of the most important laws in American history. And that law is the 1890 Sherman Antitrust Act. And it basically says, if a collection of businesses are deemed harmful to free commerce, the president can break up the company. And you can see it in the cartoon. The trusts that work with Teddy Roosevelt... They are the good bears, and they get a leash, and they get attached to the belt of the president. The trusts that are bad bears, well, they get put out of their misery. And Roosevelt knows how to use this 1890 law. He goes after the cattle trust and kills it. He goes after several coal trusts in West Virginia, and he kills them. He goes after Cornelius Vanderbilt's old railroad trust, and he kills it. And then he follows and in, in, enforces the Interstate Commerce Commission, which is left over from the Cleveland administration, to start severely regulating the railroads. None of this secret rebate deal, you know, like, Van, like um, uh, Rockefeller had worked out back in the Cleveland massacre. This causes a lot of resentment. And then you have the greatest quote from our old friend, Henry Frick. And he, this is what he says about Theodore Roosevelt. We bought the son of a bitch and then he didn't stay bought. Because Theodore Roosevelt walks around with a big stick, and that big stick says, obey the law. And again, the square deal isn't looking to smash the trusts, but it is introducing the federal government as the chief regulator of the trusts. It is the federal government that's gonna say, that is good, that is, that is bad, stop it, stop it, or we're, we're gonna put you out of a misery, just like we did with the cattle trust. And he moves against Standard Oil. He moves against John D. Rockefeller. And the court case against uh, Standard Oil lasts for years. In fact, it lasts past the end of uh, Roosevelt's presidency. But in the end, Roosevelt wins. In 1911, they kill Standard Oil. They drive a stake through the heart of the giant octopus. They force John D. Rockefeller out of the oil business and Standard Oil ceases to exist. They smash it, they break it up into, I think, 34 separate companies. And there is what happened to all the different fragments of Standard Oil. You know, they all broke apart. Now, over, you know, the last 110 years or so, some of these have reformed, some of them have been purchased uh, by foreign companies. And, you know, there's only fragments of Standard Oil around. Chevron is the biggest fragment of Standard Oil, as is ExxonMobil. Uh, BP, which is a British Petroleum, bought up a few of the fragments of Standard Oil. Marathon is a kind of a, a good-sized chunk of Standard Oil that's still around. And every now and again, like Chevron and ExxonMobil will, like, look at each other and start thinking about joining together and make, like, googly eyes at each other and kissy noises. And every time they start moving together, the government basically loads its shotgun and says, no, no, we killed you in 1911 and you're not coming back. Standard Oil is dead forever. And if you're ever reading the newspaper and wondering why Google and Facebook are spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on politics these days, it's because Facebook and Google have read a history book and they know that that Sherman Antitrust Act can mess them up. In fact, some people argue it's only a matter of time before the government breaks up Google and kills Google the same way it killed Standard Oil. But Roosevelt isn't limited to fighting the trusts because part of the square deal is that the government is going to regulate commerce and it's going to ensure that we're not going to have crazy medicines that hurt you, that we're not going to have filthy meatpacking plants. 
It's going to say you can be assured that your food and drugs are pure, which is why he passes the 1906 Food and Drug Act, which establishes the FDA and establishes the safety and purity of, well, it establishes the safety and purity of, of food and drugs. The use of dangerous preservatives, unsanitary conditions, and outrageous medical claims all become illegal. We will inspect the meatpacking plant. We will make sure that these medicines do exactly what they're supposed to do. And they don't contain, like, formaldehyde or anything like that. And the weird thing is, all of this works. It worked. Wages began to rise. Look, there's the start of his presidency, and there's the end of his presidency. All right? Wages go up. Life expectancy starts to go up. And this is not just because of the negotiations between labor and business, but it's also because they limited uh, the labor supply. They limited the number of workers that were available. Roosevelt passes several acts restricting this flood of immigration, and thus wages began to rise. And you know, Teddy Roosevelt writes a book on philosophy, and this is why he becomes known as the philosopher president. And there he is, philosophizing. And Teddy Roosevelt's philosophy is encapsulated in this large speech he gives called The Strenuous Life. And I'm going to give you, in a nutshell, Teddy Roosevelt's philosophy. And it's basically this. We should continually challenge ourselves. We should avoid that which is comfortable. We should never do that which is easy. We should always seek the strenuous life. We should do things because they are hard. And we should choose to do things because they are difficult. And because they are hard, because they are difficult, that improves us as a person. And the best thing you can do, the best place you can go to do things that are strenuous and difficult and hard is nature. Get out of the cities. Get out of your home. Go for a five-mile walk through the woods. And then a month after that, make it an eight-mile walk challenge yourself. And as you overcome these challenges, as you test yourself against nature, you become a better person. And that is how you can be your best self. According to Theodore Roosevelt, you seek, you look in nature and you seek to test yourself. You become a better, more enlightened person by seeking the strenuous life. And here's one of the great quotes by Teddy Roosevelt. I wish to preach not the doctrine of ignoble ease, but the doctrine of the strenuous life. Go out in nature. Go hunting. Take a knife and a bottle of water and survive for four days in the woods. And if, if you can do that, you become a better person. Avoid that which is easy and seek that which is difficult. And Teddy Roosevelt loves to hunt. He absolutely loves to hunt. He becomes one of the great hunters of America. I mean, he is a cowboy after all. And this leads to one of the stories about Teddy Roosevelt. It's an outrageous story, but it's absolutely true. It is the teddy bear incident of 1902. And this was the teddy bear incident of 1902. Okay, Teddy Roosevelt loves to hunt. So a congressman tells Teddy Roosevelt, you know, there's great bear hunting in Mississippi. You should come down to Mississippi. We have the best bears to hunt. There's great bear hunting in Mississippi. So, you know, a few months pass and Teddy Roosevelt goes, yeah, I'm going to go bear hunt in Mississippi. So he grabs the congressman. He's like, let's go bear hunting in Mississippi. They go down to Mississippi to look for bears. But there's a problem. The congressman was just trying to get on Teddy Roosevelt's good side. There's not actually bears to hunt in Mississippi. There's not actually good bears to hunt in Mississippi. So Theodore Roosevelt and his friends like wander around the forest for three or four days looking for bears and there's no bears. So Theodore Roosevelt is looking at this congressman and he's like, ah, you know, let's just go back to, let's just go back to Washington tomorrow. And this congressman is desperate. So he goes to his friends and he's like, find me a bear, find a bear for the president to hunt. So what they do is they go and find somebody's like little tiny pet bear and they drag it out into the woods and they tie it to a tree, this tiny little bear cub. And, and you know, the next morning they're like, oh, Mr. President, we saw a bear over in these woods. And Roosevelt's like, all right, excellent. We finally get to hunt a bear. So they go out into the woods 
And they're like, oh, look, Mr. President, look, look in, why don't you go look in those trees over there? And Teddy Roosevelt walks around the tree and there's this tiny little bear cub tied to a tree. And the bear is like, obviously somebody's pet. And Teddy Roosevelt is like, come on, man. I'm not going to shoot somebody's tiny little bear. This is absolutely ridiculous. And this, people love this story. People love this story so much that little toy bears begin to be spread around the United States and they begin to be sold as teddy bears. And that's how teddy bears are named after Theodore Roosevelt. There you go, true story. Now, because he had this philosophy of the strenuous life that you should test yourself against nature, this is how he becomes this great naturalist president. And Teddy Roosevelt greatly expands the National Park Service. He adds all of these parks because he wants to set aside these wilderness areas for Americans to go and live the strenuous life. He is enormously popular. He's breaking the trusts. He's shooting bad trusts. He's bringing the good trusts to heal. Wages are rising. Life expectancy is rising. The election of 1904 is a foregone conclusion. It is a massive landslide. The country has not seen a landslide like this since before the Civil War. My goodness. You know, Theodore Roosevelt gets 56% of the popular vote, 71% of the electoral vote. It is incredible. He is inaugurated as the President of the United States. For the first time, the elected President of the United States, because before it was he became president because McKinley got assassinated. And he puts forth his philosophy in his inauguration speech. And this is what he says. Much has been given us and much will rightfully be expected from us. We have duties to others and duties to ourselves. And we can shirk neither. We have become a great nation forced by the fact of its greatness into relations with other nations of the earth. And we must behave as beseems a people with such responsibilities. In short, he tells America, with great power comes great responsibility. But Theodore Roosevelt can't charm everyone. And one of the people he utterly and completely fails to charm is Mark Twain. Mark Twain does not like Theodore Roosevelt. And this is Mark Twain's opinion of Mr. Roosevelt. <clears throat> Mr. Roosevelt is the most formidable disaster that has fallen this country since the Civil War. But the vast mass of the nation loves him, is frantically fond of him, and even idolizes him. This is the simple truth. It sounds like a libel upon the intelligence of the human race, but it isn't. There isn't any way to libel the intelligence of the human race. Mark Twain basically says, people are dumb for liking Teddy Roosevelt. And that just proves how dumb they are. Not impressed with Theodore Roosevelt. But how exactly did it work? How did the square deal work? The robber barons, how did the AFL succeed in steadily increasing wages? Because there's an ugly side to all of this progress that I've just described. And the secret ingredient was racism. Because throughout the period, the labor unions led by Samuel Gompers began to systematically exclude African Americans from the workforce often accusing them of being strike-breaking scabs because people remembered, ah, it was African-Americans that broke the strike at the Homestead Act, at Homestead, Pennsylvania. And labor unions began to segregate the factories. They began to force out the African-Americans and they especially want to kick out the Chinese. The AFL supports one of the most racist laws in American history, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which specifically forbade the immigration into the United States of Chinese laborers. And there you can go. There's that cartoon on the upper left. The Chinese must go. It says the WPC, the Workmen's Party of California. So was Samuel Gompers a racist? That's a really interesting and open question. Uh, and the answer is, Probably personally not. Samuel Gompers never backed the segregation of factories himself, but he didn't oppose it either. And this was Samuel Gompers' opinion. This is what he said. 
Samuel Gompers wanted to make sure that the American Feder Federation of Labor was narrowly focused on a few very specific things. He says, look, the AFL is not here to fix the nation. That was the, that was the flaw of the old Knights of Labor. They were too noble. They wanted to do everything all at once, and they failed. The AFL wants to focus on labor contracts, working hours, and safety issues. We're not going to cure the country of racism. Well, this one branch wants to in, wants to segregate its factory, and Samuel Gompers is like, that's up to them. If it's not concerned with labor contracts, working hours, and safety issues, it is not my problem. So does that make Samuel Gompers racist? He certainly didn't oppose the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was really bad. I mean, you, good Lord, you can see this. Uh, race relations deteriorate during this entire period, with African Americans and the Chinese immigrants receiving the full brunt of this ugliness. After the Chinese Exclusion Act, across California and the West, dozens of Chinese laborers are murdered, and many Chinese who legally emigrated to the United States are kicked out of the country altogether. Hip, hip, hooray, Chinese excluded for the Democratic Chinese Exclusion Bill, which has been signed by our Democratic presidents back in the days of Grover Cleveland. But in the South, even worse things happen. Because in the South, the old Bourbon Democrats finally completed their construction of the Jim Crow South. The South had become a fully racially segregated society with the separation of black and white, with African Americans being placed in a decidedly inferior position. It's awful. And the U.S. Supreme Court upholds this racist segregation with one of the worst decisions in all of American legal history, Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. And this started when Homer Plessy, you know, in the cartoon, look how dark they make him in the cartoon, but that's Homer Plessy in reality. He was actually a, just a dark-skinned uh, Cajun French. And uh, he got on a train car and he said, I'm not going to sit in the black section. I'm going to sit in the white section because I have a civil right to travel wherever I want. Because he thought that the old Reconstruction civil rights were going to protect him. And they didn't. It went straight to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court utterly and totally failed in its ability to protect the civil rights of African Americans. And they made official the fact that African Americans have lost the civil rights that the Reconstruction fought so hard for. Jim Crow was backed by local laws. It was backed by the widespread lynching of African Americans across the South, often at the hands of local mobs or these secret terror groups like the Ku Klux Klan. One of the few voices that stood out was the lone dissenter in Plessy v. Ferguson, which was Justice John Harlan, who is a Southerner. He's actually from Kentucky. And Justice Harlan says, look, you are going to create a system of unfair segregation and race hatred across the South. When the Supreme Court says that segregation and Jim Crow is legal, you are going to create an issue that will stain America for the next century. And he was absolutely correct. And there's one other person, one of the few voices that fought for African Americans of this period. Emma Goldman. Emma Goldman wrote that everything that is happening in the South is absolutely terrible. And this is what she writes. After almost half a century of so-called freedom, the Negro question is more acute than ever. Hardly a day passes without a Negro being lynched. Nowhere in the country does the Negro uh, enjoy equal equality with the white man, socially, politically, or economically, notwithstanding his alleged constitutional rights. Again, to Emma Goldman, this is a dark age of racism and oppression, and Plessy versus Ferguson merely confirms her opinion. Theodore Roosevelt, be damned. And here's the odd thing about Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was not personally a racist. In fact, he often he had dinner many times with the, the civil rights leaders of the period, including uh, Booker T. Washington. That's him right there. But Roosevelt neither helped nor opposed the total collapse of civil rights across the South. He supported the Chinese Exclusion Act, and he signed the Immigration Act of 1907, which severely curtailed immigration. Yet, 
He never wrote or spoke negatively about any race. He invited prominent African Americans to the White House. He fought to keep the federal civil service and the U.S. mail service segregated. He hired a lot of African Americans, but he did nothing to fight the Jim Crow South. But Roosevelt was the consummate politician of the period. He is the politician who is going to bring this era to a close. With the square deal, the federal government is clearly and deeply involved in the domestic economy. It is not a controlling interest, but it is a strong regulator. Patriotic reform had triumphed over populist revolution. And Roosevelt is deeply committed to expanding American power, and he does so in two of the gl great glories of the age. He begins the construction of one of the greatest engineering feats in American history, in world history, the Panama Canal, fulfilling the promise of old Alfred Mahan. The Panama Canal begins in 1904, taking over from a failed French project from way back in the 1880s. And Theodore Roosevelt isn't president when it's finished in 1914, but it is finished. And here's a cartoon of Theodore Roosevelt digging a huge ditch connecting the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. And even today, the Panama Canal is one of the great engineering feats of all time. And every year, I mean, that's how it works, how they lift one boat up and over these line of mountains, moving it from the Atlantic to the Pacific and vice versa. Uh, and there's a ship going through the Panama Canal. Panama Canal generates $1.4 billion every year. It's paid for itself a hundred times over. It's incredible. The second thing he does is that President Roosevelt orders the brand new American fleet. We have the fleet that Alfred Mahan always dreamed of. 16 mighty battleships painted in gold and white. And he says, I want these guys to sail around the world. And this becomes the sail of the Great White Fleet. And the Great White Fleet is a clear demonstration that the United States is now a world power. We have 16 mighty battleships, and we can go anywhere in the world we want with these 16 battleships. We can shift a fleet from the Atlantic to the Pacific, because we dug a canal. We can reach anywhere in the world, and they do reach everywhere in the world. They sail around the world to Australia, to Europe. They go through Egypt. It's incredible. This is the the acknowledgement that the United States Navy has finally arrived. There is the U.S. Navy uh, arriving in Australia, where the Australians are like, wow, the Americans show up here a lot quicker than the British could. There's the Great White Fleet passing through the Suez Canal in Egypt. Uh, the sailors were given banners showing their participation in the Great White Fleet, and it was this enormous surge of patriotism that our great fleet can sail around the world and protect American interests. And one of the places they go is Japan. Here is the Great White Fleet in Yokohama, Japan, being greeted by the Japanese welcome American fleet, being greeted by geisha girls, having postcards made. And while the Japanese are all smiles and bows, the Japanese notice something. The Japanese are looking at these 16 mighty battleships. And they're going, hmm, a fleet has never been able to reach the Japanese home islands before. And now we know if the Americans wanted to, they could sail 16 battleships right up to Japan. And they begin to think that maybe this is not such a good thing. And this tumult, all of the clashes and all of the storm and fury of this period, did produce a kind of incredible cultural energy, an artistic vitality that produced art and literature almost unrivaled in any other point in American history. Some of the greatest novels in American history come out of this industrial age. You know, Little House on the Prairie, Moby Dick, where they hunt the huge white whale, Kate Chopin's The Awakening, you know, Portrait of a Lady by Henry James, Bret Hart's Gold Russ, who are stories about the Wild West. Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, Edith Wharton's House of Mirth, or as I like to call it, Rich People Are Bad. And it's not just great novels that come out of this era, it's also great art. And what I wanna do in this very last bit of the lecture is I'm just gonna show you eight paintings. I'm just gonna show you eight paintings and I want you to pick out the one you like the best. 
and write down the artist, the name of the painting, and the year it was in. So I'm gonna show you eight paintings. Right up above me, there's George Bellows, both members of this club, which shows, you know, these boxers from 1909. There's uh, Robert Henry's Snow in New York, 1902. Maybe that's not your cup of tea. Ralph Blaylock's Moonlight from 1885. Frederick Remington, The Cowboy from 1902. Can't beat Frederick Remington. More landscapes. There's John Kensett, John Kensett, The Old Pine from 1872. Ooh. John Sargent's Madam X from 1872. Uh, Winslow Homer, Sailing the Cat Boat, 18, uh, 1875. And if you're into abstract patterns, there is uh, James Whistler, Nocturne in Black and Gold, 1872. Pick out your favorite painting. Write it down in your notes. And the period is producing not just incredible literature, not just beautiful art, but incredible music. In fact, an entire new form of music is created during this period, coming from the African-American community. And that new music is ragtime. You get the idea. And coming from the end of the period is a new invention that Thomas Edison himself considered his own masterpiece. Edison calls it the kinetoscope. We don't call it that. We just call it movies. And there is Thomas Edison's early kinetoscope where you stare into an eyepiece and you turn a little crank and moving pictures tell a little story. And thus from the Wizard of Menlo Park comes an entirely new medium of art all together. And of course, we can't forget the great invention of December 17th, 1903, where Orville and Wilbur Wright on the beaches of North Carolina fly the first true airplane. Now, you have all of the information you need to answer that question right there and determine whether industrial America was a golden age, a gilded age, or a dark age. You should be able to evaluate the historical events between 1860 and 1920 in terms of society, politics, and the economy, and develop an argument that supports one of those three interpretations for this critical period of American history. And I look forward to hearing your informed opinion on the subject. Next, we're going to move into the incredibly weird and strange election of 1912, and I will see you there.